Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third Penguin Update. It's January 21st, and I am your host, Don Don, along with Travis and John, who's back with us this week. How was your it vacation, is- John? Vacation was fantastic, but you know what's going to be even more fun is consistency. I can't wait to be doing this. <laughs> I'm very excited. For sure. How about you, Travis? How have you been this week? Uh, everything's been good. Been nice and busy. Lots, uh, lots in the works. We're doing a lot of different advertising buys for the big upcoming event on June 1st, featuring Alex O'Connor and Dinesh D'Souza. So that's very exciting right now. So people living in the New York area are going to be seeing a lot of advertising and some exciting radio interviews as well that we are booking right now. Oh, that's really cool. And Dinesh. Yeah. Well, everyone's watching. I'm going to be there. So if you want to meet me and you want to meet Travis, you can come and meet us there. There's a high chance that I am also there. If that's, if that's, are you actually going to be there? John, John, you're going to be there. hundred percent. High chance. (laughs) High zero. Uh, Yeah. Why everyone, uh, uh, one thing, everyone who's in the room right now, just remember to hit that like button for good luck. It really helps out the algorithm. So thanks for being it here. Does, does, yeah, smash the shit out of it. Thumbs up. But I, I, I want us while we had a good week, we also had a pretty sad week, uh, comes to think about it. So last week we announced our $500 competition to draw Muhammad because we're like, you know, how could we what's the best way to tell radical Islam? You know something? We're not going to capitulate to your rules. How about we draw Muhammad? And we, we set the rules and the stipulations. It's been a week and we've had zero submission. Thousands of views, mind you. Thousands of views. We even had people ask us, what is exactly you're looking for? What do you want for the picture? For this? It's been a week. The deadline Look, is on the 28th and no one has, sub- there's not one submission. I, I have to believe that some of you are still working on your masterpieces because you really want to win that 500 bucks. And again, you have until the 28th of this month to submit. Don't leave it to the last minute. Get it to us as soon as possible. And I know we've spoken to some people that are working on their pieces, but guys, um, some of the comments I've been seeing and some of the more popular comments I've been seeing under our videos, like under my video of the piece of artwork I made where I, uh, drew the so-called prophet Muhammad, uh, saying gays good, you know, uh, I changed my mind. Don't kill gays. Um, there's a lot of like, uh, well, it was nice knowing you. I, you know, don't worry about that. Keep oh, going. oh, okay. I, I was hearing your voice. Um, yeah. So, uh, so a lot of irrationality I'm seeing, like, so when people talk about Islamophobia, I'm the guy that says Islamophobia is a bullshit. I'm seeing Don Don on the screen. There we go. So, that was my bad. I apologize yeah. for that. All right. All right, let's, uh, okay. Um, but um, so, yeah, uh, I just don't know what the, wh- why there's so much irrationality, why I'm seeing so many people think that because me living in Canada or someone living in the US, if they draw a picture of Muhammad and put it on the internet, why is this, th- there this irrational reaction that you think your life is automatically in danger? Um, what does it mean for something to be dangerous? I don't consider this dangerous. I am a public figure. People know who I am. People know my face. I go to places uh, like for our event June 1st where people know I'm going to be there. I have, I'm more afraid of, you know, getting into a vehicle when it's, when there's a lot of snow in the road and a lot of uh, water on the road, like that, that actually, and, and also statistically is of higher danger to my well being. So what's with all the irrationality in the comment section, don't let the terrorists win. I think it's important for us to stand up to the terrorists. Just that's what this whole movement is about. It's not about, you know, wanting to offend people. It's about standing against the theocrats out there that want to dictate what you can and cannot do, uh, by, by laying, uh, laying these threats out. And, and I see a lot of you buying into that and it's just, it's, that's frustrating. John, do you, do you consider Islamophobia to be a legitimate ter- term? 
Um, not the way it's used now. No, I um, I actually think a lot of words that end in phobia are similarly bullshit terms. I think that it's perfectly possible to disagree with the value system, to disagree with the types of societies it promotes or the types of actions it promotes without actually hating the people who belong to said group. I think you can make many very real critiques of Islam without hating Islamic people. Now, of course, it's possible you could just hate Islamic people on principle, and I would say that is probably Islamophobic, but um, people like to generalize. And I think that's true with a lot of phobias, actually. So um, I, I'm 100% on Travis's side in terms of the... Um, in terms of how it's a bullshit term, it's a bullshit term. It's been bullshit used as a bullshit term, at least for a very long time. And, um, you know, we should stop being well, so vulnerable, yeah. let's say, to just, you know, mean labels. Because um, people really get scared by those, even if I, they're completely inaccurate. I do want to ask you something specific, though, John. I was talking about, like, this irrational response of fear to simply drawing Muhammad. Like, I understand if you live in Afghanistan, if you live in Saudi Arabia, but but you, are you afraid of drawing uh, the, the so-called prophet Muhammad? Clearly, I, I agree with you. I think statistically speaking, being in a Western country, um, the, the odds that I will be attacked by a fundamental Islamist for doing so um, is very low. I, I agree. And I also think that there's many reasons to decline to do that sort of thing. But fear of violent retribution is not a good reason um, I, if it's something you yeah. believe. And I just want to add one more thing before uh, Don Don jumps in is that it, this reminds me of when I would, when I was touring around with Sam Harris and Sam Harris required all of this expensive security detail to protect him from these uh, so-called Islamists. And I found something irrational about that in the sense of like, I would be traveling around with Richard Dawkins and Richard Dawkins has said as much about Islam in, in his time. And, and I would talk to Richard about it. Richard, Richard would like, look at like the bodyguard standing there that's with Sam, wherever he goes. And he would kind of like laugh at it. And so would Lawrence Krauss and all these other people. So there is some level of irrationality that lives in that, um, in that space. And I think, so I used to be completely dismissive of that Islamophobic term when applied to some of these people and how they behave. But I, but I do think like, yes, it's, it's almost always used as this bullshit label on people like me who like criticize Islam. And then people are like, Oh, that's Islamophobia. And you're just doing it because you hate Muslims. It's like, no, no, I'm not. I'm doing it because I detest the ideas, but go ahead. Donna. That's like Ben Affleck, right? People are channeling. They're like, yeah, ben yeah, Affleck. Yeah. if we remember the conversation, I think it was oh, on Bill Maher yes, where yeah. Ben Affleck called that saying, Oh, you're being Islamophobic. No, I'm just criticizing Islam. But we have to recognize that Islamophobia, the term was coined, not just for whatever reason, right? We look at the way in which Muslims were treated after 9-11, for example, I had a good friend whose mom, who's married to a Hindu man who grew up in Tr like Trinidad, got pushed down the stairs of the subway while called a dirty Muslim. They were right. This is fear of Muslim. It's violence yeah. against Muslim people because of fear of Islam, Islamophobia. And I think that what we're seeing with, with the comments in this section is a similar thing. Travis and I, John, all of this entire community can criticize Islam, but comments like, let me look over here, rest in peace, lads, um, dumb ways to die. These are all indicative afraid of Muslims because of Islam. Most, when we look at most Muslim people who live in the US, who live in Canada, who even live in the world, generally you're fine. You don't have to worry about anything. Like Travis said, if I live in Saudi Arabia and I do it, or I live in Kuwait, that's a different thing. But we're here living in the West. We don't need to fear Muslims. Yeah, we, just, they, we they don't need to fear it at all. Look, so where does fear come from? If it's so irrational, no, I think no, that's the... No, 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 it's, John, John, it's like it, it, people have seen or heard of people getting their heads chopped off for pissing off Islamists, right? Yeah. Or for doing things that Islamists believe uh, Muhammad or Allah do not approve of. So I, I understand that that's a scary thing and you wouldn't want that to happen to yourself. That part is not irrational. The irrational part is that, you know, you could be some Canadian sitting down. It's like, look, I just draw Muhammad and I put it on my computer. And then everyone's like, you better run. You better go into hiding. You better look out because they're coming to get you. And then, and then like, 
you know, it, it, it's like an, an, a Muslim, just a regular, you know, uh, hardworking family man Muslim walks by and says, hi. And then the person might be, oh, God, are you going to chop off my head? That's the irrational shit. Like, it's it's okay. like it doesn't mean that all Muslims or that Muslims in general are now out to get you. It's a select few of absolute disgusting perverted pigs that are out to get you it's not muslims in general uh, and and i think this is where sometimes uh, i hate the the, the the term nuance comes in because if we look at fundamentalist judaism which doesn't really exist the way it used to right stone your kid kill anyone who's like an, who doesn't keep the sabbath of the jew that just doesn't happen anymore but if i was to read the fundamentals of the old testament i'd be like oh do i have no rational basis to fear judaism well you kind of don't because Jews aren't going around killing people in the United States. They're also Muslims aren't also going around killing people in the United States. It's not a thing that happens here. It's not a thing that happens in Canada. It happens abroad, right? When, if, for example, you look at France, there's you know the Charlie Hebdo shootings. That's a legitimate concern. And and at that place, if I was a news organization and released a picture of Muhammad, I would be like, you know, I should have a little reason to be afraid. But it's it's the irrational part of like, you guys are going to die. Or I'm not going to draw Muhammad. I'm not going to join this competition because I'm afraid for my own life. It takes it from a place of concern to a place of irrationality. In my and opinion. one quick thing, John. Uh, well, we got to let John thing. talk. Let, let, okay, we just, John, we just, we just, we just well, fucking. Yeah, like, agree with you, buddy. I'm trying. I'd like, um, <laughs> so I, I think you pointed out something interesting when you were talking earlier. Is that while people like you or people like Sam Harris will be called Islamophobic. Um, often by the people in the comment sections who are so afraid of retribution. In reality, as you pointed out, those people who conflate all uh, Muslims to be fundamentalists, who are so irrationally afraid, are actually being more technically Islamophobic than um, any of the people who get hit with the uh, who get hit with the label. It's an interesting, ironic twist there that I wanted to uh, tease out for the audience. It's totally ironic. Like we're doing this contest and then you get all these comments of people like, oh, they need to run away. They need to get that. No, it's like I would be fine going to a mosque here in in uh, in Vancouver. I've I've no I've no fear of that. Now, look now to the other side. Let's let's also talk about the other thing where in the past, in these draw Muhammad contests people have organized and done, there have been actual imams that speak to people who are radicals out there that have put a price or a, a fatwa or, or whatever it's called on the heads of the organizer. Now, at that point, that would be a legitimate uh, security concern, right? And yeah. legitimate security concern does not mean become an irrational shithead. It, it just means let's let's talk to a security company and, and look at the best steps forward. I've received hundreds of death threats in my life for different reasons. And when I pass these death threats on to security companies, almost every time they've just been like, this is just internet stuff. <laughs> a, couple, a couple times they were like, okay, this is pretty extreme. They've given you a date and time and whatever, but we've done some investigating into where this has come from and wherever. And it, it just didn't seem credible after that point. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Yeah, I, I want. Yeah. I want to add one thing. The, 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 the topic is: Are you afraid to draw Muhammad? And I would say that if you're afraid to draw Muhammad, and you live in Canada, or the, uh, even no matter where you live, like no one's gonna know your name's attached to it. It's anonymous. And, and like, True. We're, we're the only ones. You're, if you're gonna say, "Hey, I want to win, but I'm afraid," we're, we're not. It's not gonna happen. You have nothing to fear. If you live in Canada, the United States, in Mexico, you don't have anything to fear. So are you Islamophobic? What do you guys think? Do you think if a person's afraid to draw Muhammad and they live in America, Canada, Mexico, are they being Islamophobic? Potentially. I, I, think, what it's, do you think? I think it's irrational fear. Okay. So it's Islamophobic. If I think, doing, yeah. yeah, I think that you're Islamophobic. If you're afraid to draw Muhammad, I think you're Islamophobic, guys. I think we have nothing to fear. I really do. I truly, truly do. So with that being said, real, 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 real quick. The contest is still on, okay? January 28th is the deadline. If you want to submit your artwork, go to info at pangburn.com. Email. Email your artwork. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to be Picasso. You don't have to go to Juilliard or the news. You don't have to have a degree in art. It just has to represent three core things. One, has to represent freedom of expression. Two, has to highlight the fact that we're not going to let this religion capitulate to us, what we want to do. And then the last thing we grade you on is your artistic ability. So a stick figure could win this competition since nobody has submitted a picture. 
So let's just take the odds. No, everyone's afraid of submitting. All you have to do is submit a stick figure and you could win 500 bucks. It's literally that simple. That's literally all you have to do. Ron just asked a question in the live chat, which I thought oh. was interesting. Why would you do something which an entire religion finds deeply insulting? Well, my initial reaction is like uh, homosexuality and, uh, you know, thing th things that like think of how many uh religious doctrines out there would outlaw so many of the things that we do today uh why would you work on the sabbath why would you work on sunday you know uh why would you dishonor your father when it's deeply insulting to an entire religion come on like why would you why would you go ahead and try to put a satanic temple ritual in congress it's so insulting to christians why would you openly kiss a man in public that is so insulting to many religions it's not about insulting the religion it's about taking a stand and saying that your belief ends at your mind and religion is not something that we're willing to be governed by no matter how much you're willing to yell shout or threaten I'm going to stand up against that because I'm not interested in letting your religious beliefs affect me, period, nonstop. That's, it. that's, 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 what, that's what we're doing. It's just civil disobedience. We're just drawing John, a fucking person. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. John, you're, you're a cultural Christian. How do you, uh, right? Is that, is that true? That's fair enough, yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with things that you disagree with, that what, what you see happening in society? And maybe if you could give an example, or if you don't have an example, that's yeah. fine. But how do you deal with this internally? Well, I don't threaten and kill people. I mean, that's number one. Um, so I, I think I think that's a good place to start. Um, I, I generally speak out um, as precisely why I think it's good or bad. Usually I refer to utilitarian reasons why it's good or bad, not because that's the most fundamental or best way of thinking about it, but that's just because that's the more universal way of thinking about it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm involved with in my community, um, involved in some activism that is uh, outside of this show. And I just do my best to convince people and um, make perfectly legal and non-threatening moves to uh, forward the values that are good. Um, what comes to mind for me with you is abortion, right? Like, yeah. you know, abortions are happening all the time. And I think you have a pretty strong stance against abortion. So how do you go about navigating that in your life? Because to you, I'm sure abortion seems like some kind of like soft serve murder. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's about right. And, um, you know, the, it's, it's a complicated question because abortion is so institutionally and culturally ingrained. I mean, there are some Christians who like firebomb um, abortion centers. Um, I find that issue, uh, assuming that there's nobody in the building at the time, I, I find that like a kind of a morally complex case. But um, it's so morally and institutionally ingrained in our society, unfortunately, that the only way to deal with it is to, you know, fundamentally change institutions and change culture. And the way you do that is through activism. You do that through trying to get involved in government and you do that through uh, speaking out. And I try to do all three of those things. And um, whenever it touches my life personally, um, I, I plead with the person and I try to um, give them um, the best counsel I possibly can. And I don't, think don't this is where fundamental... Oh, sorry, John, I thought you ended. No, I that's think, it. <laughs> I think this is where fundamentalism stops. Right? I remember myself when I was religious, Jewish religious. I, I, I understood that constitutions, governments, that's the law. That's what I hold other people accountable to. And that religion is mine. It's my belief about the fundamental, like how the world works, what is right, what is wrong. But I can't make the decision for everybody else because the role of democracy, the role of government is to get along in spite of disagreements, not because of them. We need to get along despite the disagreements. And that's why we have democracy for. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm bumping up against you, Don Don, because you said something about how you don't want your life dictated by like other people's religious principles. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a fundamentalist who's going to attack people, but I would very much like to see the force of law prevent uh, this sort of thing. But you, um, but you wouldn't want to do it undemocratically, right? You wouldn't enact um, violence. That would be not ideal. Yes, I, I would not like to do it that well, way. Well, not ideal. I mean, John, John. it seems like John would be like, if it gets bad enough, it, it could cause a call to war, right? Um, I mean, you could you could envision a dystopian future where like 95% of like all conceptions end in abortion where, you know, I would consider maybe 
going oh. that, going that way, but I don't think we're there quite yet. But now, John, uh, uh, you know, killing in the name of of an idea is is always. Um, you know, something that you might reg- regret because tomorrow you might change your mind about abortion. Yeah, but killing in the name of the I- of an idea has also produced lots of good in the world. Um, war, yes, re- uh, like political yeah. revolutions yeah, yeah. have included, have improved civilization. And mm-hmm. while there's always that risk, um, this is why I, I abhor violence. I think war is evil fundamentally. There's just sometimes there are more evil options. Um, that so you would happening. point to World War II as an example where we kill. Yeah, exactly. Like that war was evil. Everything that happened was horrific. But guess what? Not going to war was actually even worse. Um, well, I, th- I think that we have to recognize that war is a byproduct of a situation that democratic means could not solve. Correct. Where the systems that we had in place could not have us cooperate with our disagreements. This is why we, we must create systems that allow us to work together despite our disagreements yeah but i i think that i think that works and i like that but i do think there's a level of fundamental i feel like you can get disagreements that are fundamental enough that that stops working i don't think there is any amount of conversation so if if you don't have any shared ground on anything important on the value of um of life or um any other type of example you can name or the idea of human rights or something like that. If you don't have shared ground, conversation is going to fix it because you're not. Yeah, even, but this is why, but this is why the, there's things like, you know, borders, communities. I agree. Um, and, 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 but, but there's one thing that we all do need to work on. That's trade, environment, um, uh, commerce. Like there are things that we just need each other to survive. Mm-hmm. And on those things, we need to have a way of dealing with it, no matter what your values yeah. are. Whatever I, that might I be. I totally agree. Um, but I will with, say, with that, with John, we, with that, we, we're, we can talk about this forever and ever and That's ever true. and ever and That's ever. True. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go into the next topic, which is going to involve a little Douglas Murray. So as always, we always yeah. share and watch the most popular video of the day. So let me pull that up real quick. I have Douglas up Murray. on the screen is the recent Douglas Murray video. Um, and I think the main idea, uh, Travis, if correct me, it's... Um, what is it specifically of this? Uh, um, I, I'm not seeing the video yet. Are you guys pulling it up or yeah, mind it, reading? Oh, oh, it's not. You don't see it up. Uh, yeah, yep, there it's up. Yeah, okay, it there we be, go. It should, it should be up. Okay, okay, yeah, it's mind reading. So let, let's watch this and, and talk about it. Yep. Just good practice on this question, as on a lot of other questions, which is not to presume that you can see into the heart of people who disagree with mm. you on an issue, because that is the mm. single. The reason why, as you say, you know, you're a xenophobe if you want to have any textured discussion on it, is it does, does unbelievable damage uh, uh, to the debate. And obviously that's one of the ones it's most, most pertinent on. But I mean, every single one of the tripwire issues of our time is, is vulnerable to this claim. I can see into your heart and I know what you're secretly doing. And none of your words may do this, and none of your actions may do this, but I know what you're really after. This is a very dangerous right. thing to introduce into debate. Because well, it, and this it, is what it, Kathy Newman is, the gift that keeps on well, giving. And I think because this, is, this is very important for everyone to think about. Yeah. When, you're, when you're in the, 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 in the course of a dialectic with someone, and you catch yourself trying to read into their motivations, read into their core desires, as opposed to allowing them to express those to you. You are making a grave mistake right off the bat. I would say you are no longer engaging in good faith, so you are breaking uh, basically my dialectical categorical imperative of good faith and helpfulness right off the bat. It, it is insincere to go into a dialectic and 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 instead of being there to have a good conversation, you are there to try and read into the person, read out of the person what it is that's really uh, uh, existing underneath them and that they're not disclosing to you. So mind reading, yeah, like it says on the screen here, mind reading is what we see often in the dialectic and it's something that should be uh, eliminated from our repertoire. Travis, that was a very highly... Um, genuine and convincing moral plea, and I totally agree with it. I would offer a side point. If you are going after somebody's motivations and you're not dealing with them on what they say, it's because you're losing the argument. That is the only reason you would do that. 
It, if you have to look for something that they did not say in order to beat what they are saying, it's because you feel like you can't beat what they are saying. So, you know, if the well, moral plea um, isn't working for you, then um, how about uh, the... the but I, I, I would, I, I, real quick, I want to I also add, mind reading also goes in the other way. It doesn't necessarily go, oh, I'm trying to beat you. Remember, the dialectic is not just about I'm sure. winning, you're winning. We might, you know, be watching Destiny and Vosh and all these people online and be like, oh, debate, bro, I got this. I'm going to win the, the argument or whatever it might be. That's not the point. The, 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 the point is to hear the other person. So sometimes, you know, I, I got into a conversation with someone, I think it was last week I mentioned on the show, where they're telling me, oh, the Houthis in, 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 in Yemen, they're not, they're not really motivated by death to Israel, death to America, kill the Jews, destroy the West. They don't actually really give a fuck about that. They, they, they want stability in the region. Excuse you. Yeah. They're telling me why they're doing it. It's like if I go into court and someone says, well, why did you kill your child? Hmm. I wanted to drink their blood. It was delicious. And you go, mm, that's not the reason. There's some other reason. Yeah. They're telling you what it is. Why you mind? They're telling you what their beliefs are and Look, vice versa. Uh, to that, Don Don, I released a, um, a clip recently of, of Douglas Murray dealing with that exact issue where he sits down with this politician and the politician sits down and says, so Douglas, what do you think ISIS really wants? Like, I think they're quite fucking clear about what they want. This should not be a mystery, man. Like, and and that's basically what what Douglas says. I mean, well, let's let's look at the uh, let's look at what they write or what they say. You know, let's let's do the quote farming from their mouths, from their minds, as opposed to trying to, yeah, but. Is it, and, and he makes the joke of like, yeah, maybe they're looking for a 1.5 reduction in VAT or taxes, right? Maybe that's it, because then we can we can negotiate that. But of course, that's not the point. This is this is a this is a divine mission. This is much much greater than looking for a tax reduction. This is yeah. not a you know. You know I think I think a lot of people who haven't been that religious don't understand what you actually think when you're that religious. When I was that religious, I truly believed with my entire heart that like God gave Moses rocks on a mountain. I, I believe that to the equivalent of like, if I shoot my brother, he's going to die with a bullet. That's what being that religious looks like. And I think they just can't wrap their minds around that. But before we continue this conversation, we have a special announcement, everyone. Can I, Don, Don, can I just, yeah. I, I have one quick response. John, you said that, um, that, that, that people engage in this mind reading technique when, when they feel as though they're losing. I, I think that that can be the case, but I, I wouldn't say that that's absolutely the case because I do think some people are doing this just for a lack of thinking in a different way. It's habitual. I think, I think these things can get very bad dialectical techniques can get very habitual. Sure. So, so it's sure. important for us to understand that some of this might, might come just from uh, a poor, a poor education or, or a, a perhaps a, a worse way of thinking or a worse way of, um, of uh, debating. So uh, I just wanted sure. to throw that out there, but. I could amend my statement to makes you look like you're losing, I suppose. I bet that would work. I, I think that's also more to the point of trying to like shame people into doing the right thing um, dialectically um, alongside Travis's moral plea. Just a quick thing before Don Don goes, everyone take a second to drop a like. It really helps the video in the algorithm and it, and it helps the health of this uh, stream. Well, and, I was going to uh, say that, that, man. I was literally going to oh, say sorry. that. We have some sorry, special yeah. news. And before we, we drop a like, subscribe, share, comment, tell us your thoughts. But as you know, this channel, the reason why we do these updates, we do these videos, is so we can create more live events. And luckily, um, our Travis, the channel, has have a sponsorship with Private Internet Access Video. So we have an ad we're going to run, and then we're going to ride back to the show. So enjoy the ad. We worked hard on it. So enjoy the ad. All right, folks, Trav here. I have produced legendary conversations all around the globe. Canada, US, United Kingdom, Australia. And after a long night of discussions, I want to sit down and catch up on some cool intellectual content. But now that I'm in a new country, Netflix says, oh, I'm sorry, this content is no longer available. Enter Private Internet Access VPN, my intellectual companion. Private Internet Access VPN service is not just about unlocking Netflix or Disney Plus content, it's about unlocking a whole new world of intellectual exploration. 
click connect and suddenly you have access to a conversation from the other side of the globe that you never even knew existed. This sponsorship with Private Internet Access VPN is about all of us in this community. It is going to allow us to produce more legendary events that will last for years to come. With over 30 million downloads and a no logs policy that has been proven in a court of law, your intellectual property remains yours. It's not just a VPN, it's your shield against unwanted surveillance. All you need is one VPN subscription to protect all of your devices. Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, you name it. With a mind-boggling Pangburn community discount for 83%, you're only gonna be paying $2.03 per month. You also get four months free and a 30-day money-back guarantee. All you thinkers, debaters, and knowledge seekers, hit the link below to secure your new private internet access VPN deal. Jesus Christ, that was way too fucking long. Really? Oh, it was too damn, long? That was cringe. No, I think I think we need to cut that down to like 10 seconds or something. Oh, but, uh, but I do. But look, yeah, if you guys do need a VPN service, sign up through Pangburn. You get 83% off. That, that's that. But I, one thing I wanted to say, it just when I was talking about, when I saw some of those images popping up of my uh, previous uh, live event productions, I, I wanted to put it out there that for those of you who have not watched Jordan Peterson versus Matt Dillahunty, that oh. is my favorite uh, event that I've ever produced. Um, and that was just, the, the whole thing was electrifying. Jordan and Matt were both on the edge of their seats for that. And even like, even at dinner, when we went to dinner for, for that event, those guys right off the bat were, were, were kind of standoffish to each other. And I knew as I was sitting there that that was going to be a, an electric event and maybe the, the, the greatest event I'll, I'll ever produce. A lot of people think that it would be the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson series because of all the hype behind that. And yes, that was, I, I think, uh, a brilliant a series of conversations, but that is my, uh, my personal favorite. No, I tend to agree. I think the, um, uh, personally, I am biased because that, that uh, series of four conversations between Peterson and Harris is actually what brought me in. And I think that uh, the thinking might have been a little bit more precise. I think Peterson was in better form there. But um, like Dillahunty, Peterson was probably more exciting. It was just an absolute slugfest. Uh, <laughs> it, it has, the rewatch value of that is like so high. It's unbelievable. Right. There, it's, it's a, it's a, I think that whole con- that whole Travis's events, those events are legendary. And we want to make more of those. So by getting a VPN, which is going to be good for you. Like if you have some other VPN, cancel it, get this one. It just helps the channel and it helps us do more. Oh, it's not, yeah. It's not just about like grifting. You know, people think it's just grifting. They're mind reading us. They're like, oh, selling out. Grift. It's not about that. It's about, you know, this is how it works in the world. If you don't have the funds, you can't produce events. Like it's just that yeah. simple. Yeah. And just to give you guys uh, some context, like, Producing, uh, producing the four-part Sam Harris Jordan Peterson series was over a million dollars. It required over a million dollars in funding. So just to put that into perspective for everyone, because a lot, a lot of people don't know what what this stuff costs, right? They think that like maybe a speaker will make a thousand dollars for showing up. No, <laughs> times times that by a hundred, okay? So th- it, then you're getting in the in the ballpark of of what speakers are making and and why it takes. So so much work and so so many resources to produce legendary events and that's what penguin's all about so uh thank you so much for your support and for being here and speaking of jordan peterson i think he we have we have something to address with him tonight right oh yes we do have something to address with jordan peterson tonight so i don't know if you all heard um by the way get that title change i don't know if uh y'all heard but jp is i'll just i got it there we go jp lost his case against the college of ontario okay he lost it done he's gonna have to get as he calls re-educated so let me let me pull up the tweet that he that he tweeted out as a uh here it is so here it is a higher court in Canada has ruled that the Ontario College of Psychologists, psychologists, excuse me, indeed has the right to sentence me to re-education camp. To camp. re-education yeah. camp. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other legal avenues open to me now. Well, yeah, there was the one you lost it. 
It's to it's capitulate to the petty bureaucrats and the addle padded woke mob or lose my professional license. Congratulations at CP Ontario. I can't help it. The accent just comes on. You won fantastic. this round. Mark my words, however, the war has barely started. There's high. nothing more you can take from me. I am unwilling to lose. So watch out. Seriously. You've been warned. Um, <laughs> a little bit too high pitched, but pretty good impression. Pretty really? Good. A little too high pitched? You think just so? Like, just like a little, just a little bit. Just a little bit, okay, okay. Just a little bit, but it was very good. The inflections okay, were nice. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I bow, I bow. I am not an actor. I'm not trained, but uh, you know, Travis has been you teaching. Gift, me but you do have a gift. Oh, the gift. Thank you. I know, John. You're you're a bigger um, a Peterson fan. So, what 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 do you think about it? Um, I would say that I actually followed this pretty closely, and uh, Don Don and I actually argued about this like back when it was happening. And I would amend my position to say that it seems like the college does have this ability. That's not what I'd say. I'd say that it's really dumb that they have this ability. I think that the stuff that they're going after him for is stuff that I, I don't think should be in their purview, at least in the examples. Um, and it's kind of disappointing. But at the same time, it's difficult for me to care. Peterson has promised to live stream basically the whole thing. And um, I think it's, if anything, is just going to drum up more attention towards him again. I think it's going to get more people on his side. And what I really think is going to happen is we're going to have a real Rorschach situation where um, the uh, the the re-educators are going to be in a be a lot more uncomfortable than he is. It's a uh, I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with so me. I think, situation. Yeah, but but what is what is Jordan's ultimate purpose here um, with this issue of re-education? Is his ultimate purpose? It, does he believe that there should be uh, reform within the um, school of psychologists and, and the board? And and if so, if he wants to see reform in how they do uh, business and, and how they manage their, their membership, is this the most rational way of going about this, right? Anyone who's ever had to deal with, with, uh, systems of bureaucracy. There are there are steps and appreciated like professional steps that you'll take to garner support within that that structure within that community. So considering this is like uh, like issues related to uh, you know his social media behavior, is it really rational? The, the steps that he is taking, and if the if if his goal is to just you know expose the idea of how bad uh you know any kind of bureaucratic board like this is and that there shouldn't be any then maybe he's got he's got something then maybe he's on the right track but i i think jordan's uh you know he would be more interested in seeing reform in how boards operate but i'm not i'm not too sure but either way i don't think that this is a very rational way of going about this although i do support jordan's uh of course his uh you know, his rights to, to challenge, uh, legal proceedings or, or, or board proceedings that he finds to be, uh, unfair. I actually, uh, and as much as, you know, I know John thinks it's dumb or whatever it is. I think that the college of Ontario should have the right to have specific standards for its practitioners. I, 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 I find myself dismayed to think that a psychologist or a professor or whatever can go ahead and, and make specific like statements where um, go counter to their professional degree. They go against the evidence. They go against what the literature supports and what the community supports. Because there's a, there's a there's a way in which scientists and doctors and psychologists and academics go about invoking change within the academia. Go, it's not about going on Twitter and calling people sluts. It's not about telling people that they're ugly or whatever it is, right? There, there's there's a way to go about it to actually evoke change in the academia. You do research, you you, you write papers, you argue the merits of the beliefs, and I think. Sometimes I know when we spoke about it last, you said something about oh, there's the professional side and his personal side. Well, he can't be a personal person. He can't just post on Twitter or on YouTube his beliefs. Well, he can, just not under his professional his professional guys. Because on Twitter and on YouTube, he's like doing his lecture series. He's presenting himself as a clinical board psychologist. And well, they're saying well that doesn't represent us. And we gave you that 
the name of that. We gave you the recognition of a clinician. And we're, we're, this is not okay. This is not the standards by which clinicians act in Canada. I don't see why that's not a thing that they should have. Yeah, I don't really remember making the personal professional distinction, although I might have. I, I don't remember. Um, wh what I would say is that both of you have um, invoked the idea that Peterson is fully able to try to take like legitimate more to, to your guys's minds, legitimate ways of uh, changing the institutions. I'm not sure that's super true. Actually, I'm not sure. I don't like think about this. Do you really think that the people who are in charge of um, the college and um, are really going to let like Peterson come in, get to a place of power and then like change the college to, you know, more of the standards that he thinks? I don't really think that's reasonable. Now, like you can do institutional capture over like a long enough time period, but Peterson himself doing that seems like a very low chance because it's not ex it's not exactly like they weren't antagonistic before this specific event. Um, I, I don't. I also don't think that Peterson's goal is actually to reform the institution, Trav. To be honest with you, um, I don't think he has hope of that. Now, I gave you the reason why that might be a reasonable thing to think that he doesn't have a chance of doing that. But regardless of whether or not it's reasonable, I'm pretty sure that's his mindset. And in that case, exposing why the current state of affairs is really bad and shouldn't be super respected does seem like his goal. Um, and if that's his goal, I mean, I think he's doing a pretty good job. Um, but yeah, I think I'll leave it there, actually. Um, but I'm, I'm curious what you think, Trev. Do you think that, like, Peterson, like, would have a real chance of, like, coming into the fold in the college? And well, I think I, I think if things I think if he took a, an active role on on the board and, you know, started making strong arguments that were well within the uh, the, the the criteria of, you know, of, of what's acceptable, uh because look, it's not just about what Jordan wants, right? This is this is about what what the the board of of psychologists, like like the school of psych, which should be abstracted from the school of psychology and and from uh, from uh, medical ethics and all of these things. That's where that's what should be informing all of this, not just what Jordan Peterson thinks is right. So you know, can Jordan uh, play well with others? in this kind of uh, bureaucratic soup. I, I don't know too much about his, his history in doing that, but he does strike me as, as a lone wolf type of guy. And, you know, and he's got a strong, fiery activist nature to him. So, it, you know, like what, what, I still struggle to to understand exactly what his point is with this, and and probably I, I think if we were if I had to make my be, take my best bet, I would say he wants to be able to say what he he exactly. he yeah. thinks on the internet and not have that affect the 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 good standing of his license. And I I think that there is a lot of. Uh, well-being to be had in that idea but we also need to think about if a psychologist gets online and starts saying that um you know they, they maintain their license and they start saying that you should not listen to almost every psychologist you go in and and uh hear from or or you or you're getting therapy from that could be a th that could cause a um a major issue, right? Because then you have all these, all these patients that are listening to this psychologist online, telling them that a psychologist can't be trusted. And he's a very famous one. So, you know, there needs to be rules. Wait, hold on. I want to just add, I want to just add before we, before we go to the hold on, I just want to add just, just a thing. People who are licensed by the psychology, by the clinical board of Ontario, their credentials are all equivalent to Peterson. It's not like he's ahead of their credentials, it's it's none of that. They they are equivalent to one another. So to say that because he disagrees, he can go about this this way of trying to attack it and say whatever he wants to say, and that his beliefs are his belief, and they're all woke moralists. That just dismisses their education, their credentials, what they've learned, what the institution yep. puts on them. So. Um, two things. One for the hold on is that I'm not aware of Peterson like saying all psychologists are fake. Although, I didn't say he did. I didn't say he did. I'm, I'm I was using it. Hang on. I don't want to straw man you. I was just hang on. I was using an example of. Okay. That's where a board would be necessary to step in. Yeah. This is why the board exists. That if sure. there's some 
insane psychologists out there. I'm not saying it's, it's Jordan, but if he goes out there and starts saying, don't listen to any of these other psychologists only come to me because they're all going to lie to you about your mental health. And I am the only one with the answer. Then of course the psychology board is going to step in and say, you can't have a license anymore unless you accept this retraining or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think he's done that actually. Okay. So mostly what he's doing is attacking the legitimacy of the board, which is to, which is to your point, um, Don, Don, like fundamentally, Peterson does not think that the the board is right, and he does not think that a lot of the things that he said is wildly beyond the pale. I tend to agree, by the way. I don't. I think that they're in like the ideal world, there would be something like a board that would set something like limits. But I do not think Peterson crossed out of the realm of reason in in any way. Um, to to me personally, I know we'll get to uh, one second. Um, <laughs> um, so that's 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 uh that's number one, and I think for that reason, yeah, he is trying to tear down the legitimacy of the board a little bit. Um, I, I think that's basically accurate. I mean, now that well, you raised your hand, I've lost my thought. So I guess I'm we'll sorry. Just... I'm sorry. I won't raise my hand. I'm sorry. But let, let's see. Do you think this is? Do you think this is above the pale? Okay. Let's look at this. Yeah. Let's do it. Can't wait. He, the, he responded to this. Your re- is your relationship ready for polyamory? I can't. Sh- I'm going to show you the clipping. But what do you think he responded to this, John? Uh, something hyper negative with like really flowery language. Really? Flowery. Do you, do, <laughs> Do you think it's it's do you think this is acceptable to respond with sluts are us? I think that's hilarious actually. I, I didn't say whether it was hilarious or not. Do you think this is acceptable of a board certified clinician of psychology to post? That's more of a, that's more of a that's a moral position. That has nothing to do with psychology. Why does it not have some psychology? Wait, hold on. Are, I'm I'm sorry. I thought the argument for his bad tweets were that they somehow well, reflected his uh, somehow reflected a psychological opinion that the board thought was wrong Ooh. or that he attacked the board. It does. It hey, does. It does. It, I got something here because moral position. John, John. Yeah. But John, something to think about here is that if he's practicing as a psychologist and he gets people coming in who uh, let's say are in a polyamorous relationship and they're seeking guidance and he's voicing his opinion against that because because he is he's dealt with uh, relationship issues with patients before uh, right. who have who have come to him right so if if they if if that is if his if he's saying you know someone sluts or us is what encapsulates polyamory what what does that mean for his ability to uh let's call it objectively uh, provide um, care to his patients who might be polyamorous and not, in a way that doesn't, you know, yeah, go ahead, Don. And not yeah. just that, if a doctor is on TV or on Twitter and someone says something about, I don't know, um, uh, someone that kid has Down syndrome, for example, and they have a picture of a kid with Down syndrome and their response to that kid with Down syndrome is uh, retards are us. Is that an acceptable thing for a doctor to communicate to the public, to talk about people with Down syndrome as if they're retarded, to call them retards. It's not. It's not acceptable. It should never be acceptable. That that should not be allowed. You cannot go and as a professional doctor, get on stage and call people with Down syndrome the R word. You can't do that. It's, um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not in, in your professional capacity. You cannot do that. And Jordan Peterson blurs the line between professional capacity and personal capacity. And that's where they're like, hey, man, go take some classes about social media training. Maybe you should make a Dr. Peterson account and then a my personal Twitter account and not blend the two because that's what it means to be a professional person. You have your professional persona and your private persona. And those are two different things. Okay, so so there's a few things there in which it, that's yeah. really interesting. Um I would say number one, this is kind of um, this is framed pretty well as a joke. Um, so that that like that's number one. I think that puts like a layer of skepticism over the entire thing. But the second thing is, I'm not Travis. I, I kind of want to dive through the implications of that argument for a second sure. because, right? Like, imagine like I have a very hard belief that cheating is wrong. For example, like let's say let's pretend like ethical non-monogamy is even possible. Let's talk about non-ethical non-monogamy. Um, where, you know, you involuntarily cheat on your spouse. And I put something out on Twitter saying, yeah, this is bad. Or yeah, cheaters um, have done a very bad thing or that, you know, something like that. 
or and by the way, this position is implicit to everybody who is like remotely traditionally Christian, Catholics, Orthodox, Lutherans, whatever. Um, would that make me incapable of being of providing care or providing good advice or providing in Peterson's case, um, medical counsel to somebody who comes into my office needing therapy because they're guilt ridden? No, I think yeah. it's perfectly possible to say somebody's actions are like less than morally ideal. And then also either separate that from what you're doing, because guess what? I do it all the time because I, I am surrounded by people my age who do things I feel like are immoral um, or integrate it in a very healthy and kind way. Um, I, I don't think that these are mutually exclusive ideas. Um, no, yeah. I, I, look, my answer to your number one. Yeah. My answer to your first question is not necessarily. Of course, we can think of situations where someone would utter something like, if you cheat, you're a piece of shit. And then you go and deliver an excellent uh, uh, session for someone who's come to you for clinical help. Like, n n yeah, no, of course, of course, uh, that is the case. But um, it, I, it's, it's a, you know, they, I, I think it gets down to what is this board trying to police specifically? And when we get and when we get into the specifics, you start realizing that shit. A, a lot of this is going to be uh, subjective, just like any any judge has to deal with, right? Every every judge is going to judge based on their own moral sentiments. So, to a certain point, uh, there needs to be kind of a collective general idea of what's ethical and what's not. So, I'm not I'm not read up on the specific ethical guidelines um that are that are provided but i'm sure there are some and i don't know which ones exactly they are they are referencing that that jordan has yeah, yeah go ahead i mean they have a list um they have a list um I, I i do agree god there's like three things in my head right now okay i do agree that um it does depend on what they do there is a list but this is why i'm really excited to see him like live stream the education because it's possible it's super tame it is possible that the re-education is actually not that bad and i will be thinking peterson's being dramatic there is a reality where that happens but i would i would say to you travis that if you are a traditional like imagine if you're like a catholic um person who just doesn't believe in non-monogamy anyway by being publicly catholic you are essentially saying exactly what peterson said you are like Declaring, if you are a Orthodox Catholic, you are you are public and you public about it. That means that's implicit with moral views on certain behaviors. That's what. It well, is. let's like let's let Don Don get in because it yeah. looks like he wants right. to jump I, down your throat. I so. still want to respond, Don Don. You there need, I want to there, there needs to be a clear thing of what is the thing that's making Peterson's um, uh, license be on the line. Yeah. It is not the content of the statements itself. Hmm. That's not what's being put onto the line. That's not the the con the, the way in which he has made statements online has been deemed by the college to be not in line with the way in which the college teaches clinicians in within in, in their professional capacity to address the public. They have seen that is that's breaking our rules. Okay, so, maybe. So yeah. the way in which he, what he's agreed to, he has agreed to have that this licensure from the from uh, CPO, the College of Psychologists of Ontario, and when they deem that he has needs to go back and get supplemental education because all doctors do at some point, if he refuses, he would lose his license. He's not losing his license for the content of the words. He's losing his license for not abiding by the decision of the board, which allows him and gives him the licensure to practice psychology within his professional capacity. He's not above that board and he likes to pretend that he is. And that's the hubris. That's the arrogance that I think is like where he falls in his pit. He thinks he's better than everyone. He thinks he's smarter than everyone. And well, he doesn't have the humility to stand in front of the board, to stand from the institutions that not only license him, but protect patients from malpractice and say, no, you're wrong. This is just woke tyranny or whatever it is. Didn't we just talk about reading minds? Didn't, didn't we just talk about that? Um, I mean, jokes aside, I, I don't think Peterson thinks he's better than everyone, but I do think he thinks that his judgment on these particular issues is better than the board's, which I don't think you have to be a narcissistic person to think that. I think you just have to be a like mildly confident person. Um, 
But uh, to your point, like, again, there is a version of this. I find it highly unlikely. And that's part of why I'm arguing this side. I find it highly, highly unlikely that it's only about um, delivery. Like, I, I'm pretty sure the board is not okay with him saying, like, sorry, not beautiful in any sense. I don't know if there's any way for him to say that, that the board wouldn't take issue with. I also see a theme between the statements that is not just in kind, um, not just in uh, style, however, um, but is actually in content. I notice a connecting theme. So uh, it's possible that that's what the re-education actually is. And I can't wait to see it, but I find it highly unlikely. Um, the other thing I want to say to you is just calling back. I'm sorry. Calling people with like immutable, the mutable characteristic of having mental difficulties retards is like not even remotely the same thing as morally condemning people's life choices. That is not the same. In, he's not morally, con John, he's not just more, he's it, calling it, them it's sluts. Not the same for, it's, it's a pejorative not the same for reason. To say, I, to say, I don't believe, ready, watch this. I'm going to make a tweet as a professional person. I don't believe that polyamory is beneficial for a functioning society. I've seen from this work and this point and this work, this is what it means. That's a professional response as opposed to sluts are us. That's not within the capacity of a right. psychologist. There's, sure. there's, there's, right. there's careful speech, right? I work with clients and I tell them, Hey, there's a, let's talk about how we say something is just as important as what we are saying. And if Jordan Peterson can't say things in a way that's not inflammatory, misunderstood, misconstrued, then I think the college and any uh, educational institution that has given him the accreditation that has given him the licensure has the right to say, that's not within what we have taught you. That's not within the scope of a professional. You need to change that. And if he goes, no, I'm not. Then you're going to have to mandatorily come to these classes or you cannot practice. I think yeah. that is fair. Um, I think that is well, fair. I think he's not careful with his speech. And I think that comes from, I think that comes from his arrogance. And I think well, I that think he is arrogant. From, well, I think it's definitely coming from antagonism. I mean, I, I don't know. If, again, I, I try not to impart negative motive when it's not dead necessary. Um, but I, I would say it comes from his antagonism. I would say at a certain point, he's just kind of flaunting the board I'm, um, I, because, you know, they're, they're, they're on different sides of this thing. Um, and if it's in that light, if you're just saying that he should have like said it in a more scholarly way, then I'm, I'm much actually much more amenable to that uh, distinction. But when you originally made the comparison, it, it definitely set off my uh, set off my lights. The last thing I would say here, though, is that you potentially run a risk of people who are licensed not being able to speak comedically. So like uh, Peterson was in a philosophical disagreement with somebody at one time. This person was like kind of an extinctionist type. And he said, OK. How um, he said there needs to be less people on earth. And he's like, okay, you first. Now, very obviously, Peterson isn't actually telling this guy to commit suicide. He's making it personal in order to expose the absurdity of the ideology. So I guess this kind of raises a question, right? If it is about form and not content, I know, and that's a man-sized diff for me. Um, does this mean that people who are credentialed are going to be hyper limited in their ability to be comedic or to be sarcastic? No, I think, so, that, I, I think, you know, I think that... Limited people who are credentialed should be careful with their speech. No, I know, but, the, and that's fine. And by the way, I don't think this is an absurd position for you to agree to. I'm, I'm actually just genuinely asking. It's, does I, that, I just does, think that people who are professionals. Involve, does that caution involve reigning back um, um, satire, reigning back comedy, no. and uh, reigning back sarcasm? It, it just involves being yeah. careful with how we say stuff within our professional capacity, not to blur the lines to be careful with it, to be exact. Jordan Peterson always talks, say what you mean and mean what you say. And when he tweets things like that and he's not clear, he's not following his own rules. When a lawyer, a judge, a doctor has these credentials, they have a, a, a responsibility. And with that power comes a greater sense of responsibility. And you have to hold that responsibility carefully. And I think Peterson has failed at holding that responsibility. You. We are getting to our, uh, uh, we're past our hour mark, but that's okay. Uh, I think this is excellent. Um, but I have a question for each of you and try to be brief. Uh, yes. Don Don, first, imagine you were in Jordan Peterson's shoes and you disagreed with the psychology board's uh, uh, decision to demand that you uh, undergo social media training or retraining. Um, what would you do? I would do, I think, what I have done in uh, the past when I've disagreed with an institution I was a part of. Voice my disagreement. Tell them I disagree. And then because I understand that I'm not an island and I live amongst a community, do what they tell me begrudgingly. Voice my disagreement. 
and come out on the other side of it, just like an adult. I think that's what I would do. Would you and, voice and, disagreement? And public? before you, I would. I'm allowed to voice a disagreement publicly. Okay, of course I would. Okay. Okay. And you, John? If I. Yeah. Um. I mean, I would, I would try to go through the board first as well. Um, I, I would be surprised if he hadn't tried that. Um, but I would, I would, I would generally agree with Don Don. Um, if I, if they were telling me it was about my content, I would get more precise. I would try to be as clinical and as you know professionally um, phrased as I could. But I would go on saying exactly whatever the hell I wanted to say. I would just do it in the most you know clinical terms possible. Um, to try to ward off that um, confounding variable, let's say I would very, I would, I would operate pretty similarly to Don Don. So, it, so it sounds like you both would not risk losing your license over this. Um, I would. I mean, like again, I would. I mean, Peterson's a position where he doesn't really need the license. It's more of like a moral thing, which I respect. Um, I would keep saying the things that I want to say. And, you know, if it's the content, then I would be willing to lose my license over that. But if it was the style stuff that I got rid of, then I wouldn't lose my license. It all comes down to what the college is actually. And the college and what the college you actually don't. stated. You know what he stated? I know it what was, they stated. It for wasn't the content. It wasn't. The, that's not. They, they said you violated. I think it was six point something. We went over this last time yeah. a year ago when it happened. They did not talk about. The, the, it wasn't the specific yeah. content. It was everything around the content. Yeah, and if that's actually true, I will agree with you, Don Don. But uh, I, again, I'm just highly skeptical. Well, and I and I agree with both of you that I would voice my disagreements uh, professionally, but precisely, and I would I would go along with the uh, this proposed training if need be, but that wouldn't necessarily change my mind or what I said publicly yeah. about the issue, but I would keep my, my, my public statements within the realms of what could reasonably be considered professional. Yeah. Emotion uh, is overrunning Peterson a little bit. I'm happy to admit that, especially on Twitter. And he actually is self-aware about this. Um, he's, he's being a little bit emotional and antagonistic towards the board, which I understand, but I, I like to think I wouldn't fall into the same trap. But look, that fiery nature of Jordan Peterson, that activist fiery nature, the thing that almost made him pursue political science over a psychology degree, that thing in Jordan Peterson is what brings a lot of people to, to come to enjoy his, uh, his rhetoric and his uh, way of uh, thinking. It was me. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, Guys, uh, we are in the hour. No, I'm going to have to yeah. stop everyone here because yeah. we can talk for another 30 minutes to another hour. We are in the hour. I want to thank everyone for coming oh, for tonight's awesome. show. I also want to quickly remind everyone before we get off our Drama Muhammad contest. Next week it's due. No one has submitted anything, so your chances of winning are higher. It's 500 bucks. 500 bucks. Easy 500 bucks. Also, VPN deal in the description. Two dollars and five cents a month. Two dollars and three cents a month. Don't worry about it. It's nothing. It's easy. Do it. It helps us. It helps the show. Please do it. And of course, thank you for your support, everyone. And we'll see you around next week, same time, eight o'clock p.m. Eastern, five o'clock Pacific. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. I want to talk about a remarkable phenomenon that is going on in uh, Asia um, and Africa namely the large-scale conversion of Muslims to Christianity. There was a complaint um, by a guy on Al Jazeera who said that by his count, six million Muslims are converting to Christianity each year. Christians have been saying two things. Number one, God is eternal. Eternal meaning not living forever on and on and on. Eternal in the sense of outside of time. And this concept of eternity, which seemed, from a scientific point of view, incoherent, now makes complete sense. If God is outside the universe, he's outside of time. Far from being unable to escape God, there is a very real contingent of non-believers, and I would count myself among their number, who are unable by any means to discover him, who seek and do not find, who knock and receive, as it were, no answer. I think it would be great if God existed. I really do. I would, I would absolutely love to escape death. I would relish being the recipient of unconditional love. Less selfishly, I would love to be able to worship that which deserves to be worshipped. I just don't think it's true. Now, try as I might, look where I can, I find no response, no hint, 
Nothing. <laughs>